Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you made it through the cold to get here this morning, and happy Valentine's Day. There's nothing more romantic than Sunday morning in church, so good to have you here. Um, it is Valentine's Day, so we're going to do a couple special things uh, with, uh, with that in mind, and so right now I want to go ahead and invite Tim and Janie Cass to come join us up here on stage. Will you welcome them with me as they come today? Tim and Janie have been a part of New Life Church for a number of years, have served in a number of different capacities. Janie regularly serves in the nursery. She was actually doing that this morning already. And uh, Tim is one of our board members here at the church. And so uh, with it being Valentine's Day, we thought it'd be good to talk to some people who've got a little bit of experience about life and marriage and relationships and see what we could learn from them. So excited to have you guys here. Thank you so much for being willing to join us. And uh, we're just going to kind of interview them with a few questions and stuff. So uh, to get us started, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you guys met, how long you've been married, and kind of just start the story for us? Again, I get to do the easy part. <laughs> we went to rural schools, one-room rural schools, for eight years. And those schools used to do uh, a lot of community things. they get together and we do speaking contests, we do music stuff, we would do a little track meets, all that stuff. If any of you are from around here and maybe a little bit old, but not really as old as we are, uh, you probably were participating in some of those things too. But I've known about her. We only grew up 18 miles apart, but I've known about her, I think, since I was about in the seventh grade maybe, and she was in the fifth grade. I can't remember for sure. But we've been lifelong acquaintances, I guess you could say. And uh, one thing led to another, and I saw her in a dance band singing when she was in the eighth grade. And I kind of liked her. <laughs> <laughs> so 55 years later, we're still together. 55 years married, married right? Married, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 55 but years But you didn't married. get married in eighth grade, right? Uh, Just no, checking. I was 15. No, no not quite. That's no, not true. I was either. nearly 21, and she was <laughs> nearly 19, or 19 coming up on 20, I guess. So you guys have been married for 55 years. I said, I hope my wife is willing to put up with me for that long, <laughs> assuming I survived that long. Um, uh, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family? I know you got some kids, and we got some pictures to show with that. So can you tell us a little bit about your family and all yep, that? Yep, we got four here, and um, the first one is on the left. She was just really little and lots of hair. And then the second one's on the right there. He was a big guy with not much hair. I'm like, you sure he belongs to me? Anyway, we, the second one there is adopted. He's our third child. And the last one there, Jeremy, Marnie, Tim, Joe, and Jeremy. Yeah. Anyway. So four yeah. kids. Yeah. Four, yep. Four kids, one adopted. One adopted. We got eight grandkids, and we have a great ba grandbaby on the way. Great grandbaby in May. on the way. Yeah. Awesome. Woo, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, so good to um, see a little bit about you and your family. I'm sure some of you guys may know some of their family as there's, uh, they've been around here for a while and stuff. But uh, yeah. um, so you guys have been through a lot of life together. And uh, you can see kids, grandkids, some of those pictures there. Uh, a lot of life, 55 years married, incredible. Uh, so you guys know, as well as probably anybody else who's married, and some of you maybe who aren't even married but know this, uh, successful marriages take investment. And uh, it takes work and it takes investing into the relationship. So can you guys share some of the things or maybe one or two of the things that you've done uh, in your marriage that's helped you to be able to last this long 55 years later? Well, I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, when I married Tim, his family never missed church. So it was just a great experience. And we had a pastor come that was, you know, um, from the assembly of God. And we, I would come down here on Sunday evenings with his wife. But anyway, finding out about the Holy Spirit. And I was just, God is real. And Jesus really did what he said he did. And I just, I was so excited. I just thought, wow, this is real stuff. Anyway, I uh, think that's the bottom line, just hanging on to him and growing spiritually. It just does so much for your kids and your you know, your marriage and Absolutely. different things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Investing just into your relationship our, with God is an investment yeah. into your marriage. It just That's became huge. our whole 
life, mine anyway, yeah, and Tim's. But anyway, that's always been really important, and I know it's helped us through a lot of things. That just to worship Him and just to you know have that relationship grow with Him, spend time with your Bible, reading your God's Word and prayer and worship was my big thing. Oh man, yeah. I loved worship so. Anyway, That's God good. says he inhabits your praises. And <laughs> yeah, and so inviting him into your yeah. life and into your marriage and into your relationship yeah. is I, huge. Tim? Uh, I was just going to say marriage, as you know, is a process. And uh, the way we used to do it, we got married reasonably young. Um, didn't know much. Kind of flew by the seat of our pants. And... Uh, We've been through a lot of stuff, as you've mentioned, uh, bankruptcies, loss of family members. I've lost my two younger sisters. Our parents are gone, of course. I don't know why, because we're only 50, but <laughs> anyhow. 50 years old and been married 55 yeah, years. Yeah, That's impressive. My math was never very good, even though, I, <laughs> even though I did try to teach it, but whatever. Um, so, so life is a process, marriage is a process, and one of the things I learned probably way too late was that we men are very prideful, especially when we're young. This is, this is me, and this is, this is the way it's going to be, you know. And one of the things I had to learn was through the years is to, to kind of get rid, try to rub something knock some of that pride off, rough edges off, sharp edges off, um, and to trust a woman's tuition. That's, that was a tough lesson for me for quite a while, and it's important. Um, when you're making decisions as a f couple, as a family, we are a unit, we are one, we're a team, there's no I in team, so on and so forth. But... All through the years, as I've done many, many, many things, I've placed her in mm -hmm. difficult situations. And uh, from multiple, I don't know how many times we've moved. I lost track after 20, I think. But uh, <laughs> I've changed careers in and out of education three times. And I've changed, farmed, I've coached, I've taught. I've done a lot of things mm -hmm. and left her with kids to try to figure out how to make him happy. <laughs> and uh, that was tough to learn to get that all through. Yeah. He's always been a good example. <laughs> Loved his kids. So <laughs> not quite. Anyway, we were, every situation is so different, but yeah. that's why it's so important to make Jesus Christ a, a, something that you hang on to yeah. and something that, get, you know, as you worship him, he get, brings you through so many mm -hmm. things. Oh, yeah. my. You just. I just say, keep your eyes on him, because <laughs> yeah. difficult things are going to happen, and and uh, so anyway, he has done so many awesome things in our life. I, you know, we just have so many stories. Everybody does, and every situation is different. And we grew up on the farm and very supportive families and parents, and you know, it, every situation is different. But the bottom line is. Keep your eyes on the Lord, and I'm just, well, that was so exciting to me to find out he's real and he cares, and nothing's going to change that. Yeah, so. that's huge, and when you keep God as a yeah. foundation in your relationship, yeah. you can face a lot of those challenges yeah. in ways that uh, would be a lot more difficult to try to do without that. Uh, so I know you guys have kind of already talked about this, but uh, my next question is, um, how have you seen God at work in or through your marriage? And uh, like I said, I know you've already talked about that, but just anything you'd add there for how you've seen God uh, at work in your relationship and throughout your lives? Well, as I have alluded to some things that have happened, some, some of us are kind of thick-skulled, mm -hmm. and I being one of them. <laughs> and sometimes lessons are tough to take and penetrate and take to heart. But when we were going through our most difficult times in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s with the farm and going broke and not doing well, we still continued to trust in the Lord and we were faithful about our giving even though we were not making any money. We were still giving uh, an old, old 
member of this church. None of you know him, but, well, I shouldn't say that. There's a few of you that knew him, but G.V. Anderton said one time, we were talking about pledging and giving to the church, and, and someone said, well, do you give off of your gross, or do you give off of your net? And he said, well, do you want a gross blessing? Or a net blessing. <laughs> and that kind of rung a bell with me, it seemed. And uh, So I don't know how people go through difficult times like that and all the other things I've alluded to. And you all have more probably than we do because we've really been blessed. But uh, I don't know how they do it without God in their house. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense for... Two people to try to come together, you know, a cord of three is much stronger than two. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the, the God in your life, in your family, and in the Holy Spirit there, it's going to be tough, Yeah, in my opinion, Yeah, in our experience, I should say. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you this question because we've talked about it before, but I didn't ask you this in the last service because uh, you had already alluded to it. Um, Janie made an album. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, and... She did an album in uh, 1980, which, for those of you who were in this area during that time, especially if you were anything connected to the farm, uh, those were difficult times. Interest rates on an operating loan, I was paying 18%. Wow. Now tell me how you make money on that. And the commodity prices were worse than they are by far now. But she decided, she'd been wanting to do an album, gospel album, and through the grace of a lot of friends and neighbors and communities, we did, they did some fundraisers, and, and uh, she was able to do an uh, album uh, in 1980, and one of the lead songs in there, in my opinion, and it's not in hers, I guess, but it was in my opinion, was <laughs> One Day at a Time. And basically, without taking one day at a time, one step at a time, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to rely and trust and have faith in each other and trust that God's going to take you through it. Amen. That's good. God yeah. said he works all things for good. <laughs> Absolutely. That's my. <laughs> so that includes the difficult times. And yeah. 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 I just, when I pray, it's like, pray, uh, God says, you know, um, as though it's already happened. Mm-hmm. I said it this morning, <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but believe those things that aren't as if they were. Yeah. So when you're praying, pray as if those things are done. Yeah. And he does it. I trust him. I mean, Lord, yeah. he works it for good. It might not be what you expect, but. <laughs> but he's at work. I'm just all so of it. thankful for him and for this church and for so many friends and. Yeah, if it hadn't have been for us already being involved in this church in the early '80s. Um, I'm not sure what would have happened. Uh, yeah. this, was, this was where it was holding us together right here. Uh, I was going to say one other thing there, and I already forgot it. I guess that's part of being old. That's all right. <laughs> Experienced, not yeah. old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me just ask you guys one more question then. Um, it, there, we've got a lot of people here in the room, people watching online, uh, some of them married. I don't know if anybody's going to beat you at 55 years, but uh, uh, some of them just entering into uh, early on in a marriage relationship, some of them looking towards marriage, all of that. What's one or two pieces of advice you would give uh, to us who are younger than you and, and uh, who have some things to learn uh, about marriage, about relationships, about life? What's one or two piece of, pieces of advice you'd give to us? Go with the flow. <laughs> I don't know. I'm one of those people who just, you know, when things happen, you just get through it by prayer and worship. And, and God's, I don't know, I just trust him. And uh, nothing, just don't let anything change that. Yeah. And keep that try to a... keep, yeah. And don't try to keep anger out of your home. I always wish I had a better sense of humor. Both of my brothers are really funny and my dad. <laughs> but anyway, if you can just, you know, don't. Don't give up. Keep going. That's good. Yeah. I mentioned uh, earlier that um, in talking about we got married reasonably young, not as young as some folks, but um, we live 
you live in a totally different time and a totally different culture than what we grew up in. And many of you have chosen different directions and different options than we did. But when he asked me that question about some advice, my response immediately was two words. Why wait? We've had a blast. It's not, oh, it's not been fun all the time. But we've been able to stick it out and get through it. Yeah. With God's help. With God's help. When you find that one person, commit. Be committed and Commitment keep Commitment is huge. Keep going. I didn't say this earlier, but I've thought often. I had a classmate, a boy, and he got married after his sophomore year in high school to a girl that was a little older than him, two years older than him. They survived 50-some years together. She passed away recently of cancer, but wow. they worked out a career. They, and I've told many people, marriages can work, but it's a project, mm-hmm. and it's, it takes a lot of commitment. Yeah. And even if they don't, hang on to God. I mean, yeah. it, Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't work that way for everybody, but nope. yeah. anyway. He's never, still there. He's still faithful. and Yeah, never lose your trust in him. Absolutely, and, yeah. No, he's working. Well, that's so good. Well, thank you guys so much for being willing to share. Can you give them a hand? <laughs> thank you guys so much. Good words of wisdom and advice there. Um, hang on to God no matter what. And in the ups and downs of life, you can find Jesus working in powerful ways. Uh, Tim, why wait? If you're uh, entertaining that conversation, you know, c- make the commitment. And when you make the commitment and follow Jesus, he's going to work out all the details. So uh, today, before I shared, I just figured it'd be better for them to share because they've got a lot more wisdom than I have to offer on anything that has to do with relationships. But since it is Valentine's Day, uh, I had every one of our staff members ask me if I was going to talk about relationships. So I said, well, I guess I'm probably better then. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 and start starting in verse 18. And uh, to get us started today, to get us kind of headed in the right direction as we talk about relationships and it's Valentine's Day and all this kind of stuff, I want to share with you just a perspective that I think is so important for us. And it might sound a little old-fashioned. It might sound a little out of touch or a little impractical in some ways. But I think it's so foundational if we want to experience the life that God has for us in our lives as individuals, but especially in our lives as in relationships. And so Here's, here's that perspective I want to start with. It's this, that the Bible gives us the best foundation for how to have a healthy relationship. The Bible's words, what the Bible teaches, what the, the principles that we can find in Scripture are the best things that we can adopt into our lives if we want to have healthy relationships. The reality is we live in a world where all kinds of people are talking about relationships. You know, people, people are talking about marriage or they're talking about finding that special someone or they're talking about their friends or their family members or they're talking about relationships all the time. Relationships aren't a uniquely Christian thing. There's all kinds of advice we can get out in the world um, around us about how to have good relationships. But as I'm sure you've heard the statistic that's not not a new one and has held true as time has gone on, about half of marriages end in divorce. And that's tragic when it happens. And, and sometimes when, when people are walking through those times, part of the reason that can happen for some people at times is because they're listening to bad advice. They're listening to bad perspectives from people outside of them about relationships. But I think if we come back to this reality, the Bible is the best foundation when we follow God's way and we listen to what God's word says and when, when everybody who's involved in the relationship, both husband and wife or your friends or your family members, when everybody's following God's way, relationships are going to be the best that they can be. And so as we turn to Genesis chapter 2.18, we get into what God's perspective is on relationships. We're going to talk about it by looking at the very first relationship that there ever was. And that's Genesis chapter 2.18. It says this to start us off. It says Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now, 
Up to this point in the book of Genesis, God has created the heavens and the earth. He's created the stars and the sun and the moon, and he's created land, and he's created the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the livestock and the animals around the ground and all of this stuff. He's created Adam and everything up to this point that God has created. When he's created, he said, it's good. He saw what he created, and he called it good. This is the first time in in all of Scripture, this is the first time we see that God calls something not good. In Genesis chapter 2, he sees something that he says, that's not good. And what was it? It's that Adam was alone. He was isolated. He was by himself. Now, as we continue on in verse 19 and 20, it says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So God notices it's not good that he's by himself, Adam notices this as well as they're starting uh, into his first job, which is naming all the animals. As he's doing this job, Adam's starting to notice something. Every animal that he's naming has a counterpart, has a partner, has, has something corresponding to it that they're, that they're existing together. And Adam is looking at all the animals that he's naming, and he's recognizing there's something wrong because he doesn't have the same thing that they have. A, a corresponding partner, a counterpart to him. And so Adam recognizes this isn't good. God recognizes this isn't good. And to start us off talking about relationships this morning, I just want to, I just want to say something that I think is, is kind of obvious as we look at these first verses, but it's important that we don't just pass over. And that's this, that we were not created to live life alone. We were not created to live life by ourselves. You could talk to counselors and psychologists and people. They would say this too. They would say, if you want to be as emotionally and mentally healthy as possible, you need to have relationships, connections with other people. Now, by the way, this applies whether you're single or married. This isn't just something that's saying, well, it's, it's not good for, a, for, for somebody to be alone, and so everybody should get married. I know not everybody's going to get married, but whether or not you're married, it's not good for you to live your life by yourself. We were not created by God to live our lives isolated, separated by ourselves without inviting others into our lives. Even God himself exists in relationship as an eternal trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God created us to live in connection, to live in relationship with others. Now, sometimes the natural pull of life gets us busy and gets us running a hundred different directions, and it can be easy to separate ourselves from relationships. But can I tell you this morning, whether you're single or whether you're married, it's not good for you to try to do life by yourself. God calls us into relationship, into community, into connections with others. Now, if you're, if you're married, that primary relationship that you have on this earth is your spouse. And you should work at cultivating that relationship and, and growing that relationship and making sure that you're, you're there for one another as you go throughout life, as Tim and Janie shared with us uh, in some powerful ways through the challenges that they went through. But even if you're single and you're not married, can I tell you this morning, that means that you just need to be even more intentional about finding those relationships in your life whether it's family members, meaningful friendships, whether it's people at church, people you serve with, whatever it is, you need to be very intentional about finding the right kind of people that you're cultivating relationships with. Because whether or not you're married, it's not good for you to exist and try to live life by yourself. God created us to live in connection and relationship and community with others. And when we don't, we miss out on some of the most powerful ways that God would want to shape us. I can tell you this morning that, that some of the times in my life when I can think back to the moments where I've experienced the love of God so powerfully has come through the vessel of another person. God will use other people in your life to do things in your life, to work in your life, to pour out his love into your life. It's not good that we live life by ourselves. So whether you're single or you're married, you need to be intentional about cultivating relationships. If you're married, you need to make sure you're intentional about that relationship with your spouse. Now, 
Continuing on in the second part of verse 18, uh, it starts off, it says, then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. And then he says, here's what I'm going to do about it. He says, I will make a helper fit for him. That word helper is really important. And then you go on down to verse 21. It says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought him... uh, and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam has this experience. He's naming the animals. He's recognizing they all have a partner. They all have a counterpart and I don't. And, and, and this is not a good thing. It's not good that man should be alone. And so God causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep. He does surgery. He takes a rib and he creates woman. And now Adam looks and he says, this is is the counterpart that I was missing. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This isn't, you know, just like me having, having a, you know, the, the, the squirrels running around saying, hey, I'm going to name the squirrels or something like that. It's like, this is, this is somebody that's meant to be my counterpart. And what God calls this woman is really significant. He says, I'm going to make a helper fit for him. That word helper is important that we understand what, what that actually means. Because I think oftentimes in our culture today, when we hear the word helper, sometimes we can hear that and we can think of that idea of helper as sort of like junior partner. The one that's, that's there and we're happy they're there. That's good. And you know, it's all great. But really they're, they're the lesser partner. They're the one that's kind of down a few steps or something like that. Or almost you can get the idea of like when your two year old comes up to you and says, Hey, I want to help you cook dinner. You're like, great. You're probably not actually going to be a whole lot of help here. You're just, you know, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're a part of this, but you're not actually helping make the project happen. That's oftentimes how we think about the word helper. But this word helper is a Hebrew word called, and it's ezer is the word. And the word, he, the, the word that's used here is used multiple times throughout the Old Testament. And this word, about 60% of the times it's used, is used of God in that God is the helper of Israel. It's the idea that, that, that God is the one who came to the aid of Israel and gave Israel what they couldn't get by themselves. So when we look at Genesis chapter 2, and God says, I'm going to make a helper fit for this man, and, and, and Adam looks at her and he sees this helper fit for him. The woman wasn't the junior partner. She wasn't the lesser one. She wasn't the one that was lower on the totem pole. She was meant to be a partner to him. She was meant to be this one who was going to come into his life and give him something that he couldn't get if he tried to live by himself. So as we're talking specifically about marriage, here's here's how I think that applies. Marriage is about partnership, not competition. Marriage is about partnership. As husband and wife, this Adam and his helper, this wasn't Adam up here and Eve down here somewhere. It was Eve coming into the picture to be the helper for Adam, to be the partner, to be the one who was going to come alongside him and help him to experience life the way that God intended for him to. And the same thing should be true of us in our marriages as Christians. We should seek to have the kind of relationship where our spouse, whether husband or wife, if you're, if you're a husband, then your wife, if you're a wife, then your husband, should be the one that's coming alongside you as your partner. You're not in competition with one another. You're not trying to see who can get on top, who can win, who can whatever. I mean, you can play games or whatever and be competitive if you want to. I'm a very non-competitive person, so that's not really compelling to me most of the time. But, you know, that competitive drive we have in us, sometimes that can be good. It can help us accomplish more things. It can help us move forward. But sometimes we can be competitive in our relationships in the sense of who's in control right now, who's making the decisions, who gets to decide. The goal in marriage is not to, not to be in competition, it's to be in partnership. And can I say, if you're not married, and we're trying to talk about how this applies not just to married people, but if you're single, the same thing is true. 
the friendships, the people that you invite into your life, the people that you invest into relationship with, where you recognize it's not good that I'm alone. It's not good that I'm by myself. So I need to invest into significant connections with friends or family members or whatever. The goal in those relationships is not to be in competition, to see who can be better, to see who can, who can be the one that runs the relationship or rules the friendship or who's the one that's always making the decision. The goal is to be partners, to, to help one another grow together, whether in marriage or whether single, the goal is to pursue God's best for one another. The goal is to say, what can I do in my life to pour into you so that you can see God's best in your life? That's how you enter into into a marriage. That's how you can enter into these friendships and these meaningful relationships that you have into your life. Not for what I can get out of this, but to recognize if you're married, your spouse is the person that God has placed in your life and given you the incredible opportunity to say, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I see God's best in their life. In my wife, in my husband, whatever, whatever your case would be, if you're a woman in your husband, if you're a man in your wife, you can look at that person and say, my, my privilege in life is to be able to do everything I can to see God's best cultivated in my spouse. If you're single, it means finding the kind of friends, finding the kind of connections in your family or whatever, where you're pouring into their life saying, my goal as your friend is not to just be the person that you hang out with when you're bored or when you have nothing else to do. My goal is to see God's best in your life, to pour into you in such a way that I bring God's best out of you. The goal is to pursue God's best for one another in all of our relationships. And in your marriage, for those of you who are married, I would encourage you to think about that for your spouse. Husbands, for your wives, what are you doing in your homes? What are you doing in, your, in the way that you order your lives to try to make sure that your wife sees God's best in her life? Wives, what are you doing for your husbands and how you spend your time and how you order your life in your relationship to see God's best in your husband's life? If you're single... Look at the significant friendships that you have with godly people and ask yourself, what am I doing to pour into my friends, to my family members, so that they can see God's best in their lives as well? Now we continue on uh, in verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, as we're talking about relationships, this definitely seems like it applies a whole lot more to marriage than it does to other relationships, and it does. And as we're looking at this, uh, what, what, is, what is the author of Genesis trying to say here? What are we trying to get out of what we're reading? There's, there's all these things about, you know, we got to leave mother and father and, and hold fast to your wife. They become one flesh. They were naked and not ashamed. What is all of this trying to point us to? What's the reality that this is trying to drive us toward to tell us about how to have good and biblical marriages and relationships? Uh, and, And here's what I think it is. It's that fulfilling marriages strive for togetherness in every area. Fulfilling marriages strive to to work together and to come together in every area of their lives. That's not to say that you and your spouse, if you're married, aren't going to have your own uniquenesses and your differences in your personality or your different preferences about certain things. But as you look at your life and as you try to pursue Jesus together and as you try to live for God as individuals and as a couple, the question is, are you doing what you can to come together and to pursue Do him together in every area of your life. This is why it says here that the man's going to leave his father and mother. In other words, when you get married and you make a commitment in marriage, you say those vows, the commitment is this. That relationship becomes the primary relationship from this point on. My primary commitment, my primary relationship, the number one person on this earth that I should be invested into is not my parents, not that I don't love them, and not that I don't want to see God's best in their life, but it's my spouse. That's why God brings us together is as married couples. 
And so they leave father and mother, says they should hold, he should hold fast to his wife. They should, they should be drawn together. And it says they should become one flesh. Now, growing up in church and stuff, I would hear that. And it was always kind of talked about in the terms of sex, that that's what that was looking at of becoming one flesh. Now, it certainly applies to sex. It certainly does. And that, that's included in this, but it's so much bigger than just physical union in sex. When it's talking about becoming one flesh, it's talking about how the reality of the lives of Adam and Eve, these two different people, when they came together in this covenant of marriage, their lives became one. Two separate things came together to form a relationship, a connection, a bond, a partnership where they were together from that moment forward. Their primary allegiance was to one another. They were, they were seeking to live and strive for togetherness in every single area of Of their lives. That's what this is pointing to. Now, in verse 25, it says, And uh, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So if you're married, enjoy, have fun with that. If you're single, obviously that looks a little different. What they're talking about here, what we're looking at here, is not just not just physical nakedness. The picture here is that there was nothing separating Adam and Eve from one another. There was nothing between them. They were together in every sense of the word. And can I tell you this morning, in your marriages, if you want to have a healthy marriage, you've got to strive to have that kind of relationship where you're not holding anything back. You're not placing anything between you and your spouse. You're seeking togetherness in every single way. But then let me go back to what I've been trying to bring things back around to as well. Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're single. Maybe for whatever reason you don't have a spouse. Can I tell you, it's still important that you in your life find people where you can pursue Jesus together. Friends who are going to come along the journey with you. People who are going to encourage you and push you to pursue Jesus more. And to find people where you're walking together and following Jesus together where you're trying to pursue togetherness and saying, how can, how can we help move one another forward? And this picture of this being naked and not ashamed, obviously that's not going to be sex if you're not married because the Bible is clear that, that marriage is the context in which sex should happen. Outside of that, it's destructive and it can bring a lot of pain and hardship. But if you're single, here's what I think you can draw from that. There's this reality that in your life as a single person, you need to find people that you can be completely transparent with. You need to find people in your life that, that you're not holding anything back from them. People who know you well enough that, that, that are good and godly people, that are people who want God's best for your life so you can be completely open and transparent with those people. If you're single... You need to find some good friends. You need to find some friends who are going to come around you and encourage you and challenge you to find Jesus and pursue his best for your life. And you're not going to be able to fully receive what they have for you. You're, they're not, you're not going to be able to fully respond to how they would encourage you to move forward if you hide part of who you are from them. As people, we need relationships. As people, we need connections. It's not good for us to be by ourselves. So God creates community. In Genesis 2 with Adam and Eve, we see this in the context of marriage. And they come together and they become husband and wife. If you're married, you need to not have anything between you and your spouse because God wants to use that relationship to help you grow and to help you move forward, to help you pursue God's best for your life. But if you're single, you still need to find friends that you can be open, that you can be transparent, that you can talk about what's really going on with your life in your life. Because if you don't find those people... You're missing out on that, that reality that God was looking at when he says it's not good that man should be alone. You're still trying to live, yourself, live your life alone in some sense. The Bible uh, talks a lot about marriage in a lot of different ways, and we could, we could go to a lot of different areas. But what I think 
as we, as we look at this through this paradigm of the Bible is the best foundation for healthy relationships, whether you're married or whether you're single, here's the challenge that I would want to give you today on Valentine's Day for those of you who are married, maybe you got plans for how to celebrate if you haven't already, or for those of you who are single and maybe you're frustrated or annoyed that it's Valentine's Day. Can I give you this challenge? Here's the challenge. To sacrificially invest into pursuing your partner's best sacrificially invest into pursuing your partner's best. If you're married, here's something I tell uh, uh, couples in premarital counseling uh, usually uh, quite often. I say, your marriage wasn't primarily intended to make you happy. It was intended to make you holy. Now, that's not my original idea, but I don't know whose it is, so I can't credit them for it. But God wants to use marriage in our lives to push us closer to him so that we can discover more of who he is and so that we can experience more of his grace and his peace and his favor and his power at work in our lives. Your marriage wasn't primarily intended to make you happy. It was intended to make you more like Jesus. Now, if you're single... Maybe that's not in the context of your marriage, but can I tell you, God, I think, would challenge you to be intentional about surrounding yourself with good and godly people who are investing into your life and you're investing into their life to make sure that they're seeing God's best in them. But here's the challenge when it comes to relationships, whether friendships, family members, or whether it's your spouse, that sometimes when we think about trying to invest in others this way, it's like, well, what about me? What about my needs? What about, what about me connecting with people? What about, what about me getting what I need from this relationship? And that's a very natural, normal, human way for us to think about things. Here's, here's a perspective I think that's helpful to take from this. As people, we're all going to come to the end of ourselves. We're all going to come to the point where we don't have anything left to give. We're all going to come to the point where, where we say, you know, I, I wish I could do more, but I just, can't, I, just, I just can't do any more. I've come to the end of myself. And we're all going to come to points where we're needing something from somebody else, where we're needing uh, somebody to pour into our lives. If we're looking to other people to fulfill every need in us, we're going to be disappointed. We can only find that in Jesus. And the only way that we can have healthy relationships is to lean into the love that Jesus has for us. Who in all of human history gave more sacrificially for your good than Jesus? Jesus left heaven, he came to this earth, and he did it because he saw we were in a mess. And he entered into our mess. And as he entered into our mess, he did it with love and grace and compassion so that when he went to the cross, he sacrificed his own life so that you could see God's best in yours. As you think about your marriage this morning, those of you who are married, and you think about your spouse, and you think, I want, I want to see God's best for his life. I want to see God's best for her life. I want to see God's best in, in my spouse's life. But I don't know if I, can, I, if I can really get all the way there. Can I encourage you? Jesus has everything that they need. And if you allow Jesus to pour his love into your life, then you're going to be able to, by his empowerment, help your spouse in the ways that they need. But what about me? What about my needs? If you're turning to Jesus, he's got the answer for all of your needs as well. If you're single, you're saying, well, if I'm turning to Jesus for strength to love my friends, to love those significantly, those significant relationships in my life, those family members, whatever, it's the same thing. As I'm relying on the love of Jesus, he gives me the capacity to love them well and to encourage them to pursue God's best for their life. And then for you, as you turn to the love of Jesus, he's got everything you need. Now in your relationships, whether it's with your spouse or with a friend or family member or other significant relationship you have in your life, imagine this. If you were giving everything you could sacrificially to serve them so that they could see God's best in their life and they were doing the same for you, wouldn't that make your relationship better? Because then all of a sudden it's not about, well, what about my needs? It's about me doing everything I can to pour into you to see God's best in your life. And as I do that and you do that for me, we're going to grow together and God's going to do incredible things. So today as we prepare to close our service, here's what I want to encourage you with. 
sacrificially invest into those relationships and to bringing God's best out of the people that he's placed in your life. If you're married, the primary relationship that needs to happen is with your spouse. But even if you're not married, you need to find people in your life that you're investing into and they're investing into you so that we can follow Jesus together because it's not good that we live our lives separated, isolated, lonely, and by ourselves. God didn't intend it that way. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray for us here in just a moment. And then as I, as I, as I do that, when I close in prayer, our worship team's going to lead us in that song, Reckless Love Again. Why? Because I think it's a great reminder of the love that Jesus has for us. That when his love fills our hearts, he gives us the capacity to love our spouses, to love our friends, our family members well. And that when we don't have enough, he is enough. And so we're going to close reminding ourselves of that by singing Reckless Love. So Lord Jesus, this morning we come before you and we just ask that you would help us to love the people you've placed in our life well. God, I pray for those who are married, for our our marriages, our spouses. God, I pray that you would help us to invest our lives committed to that person, to pull the best out of them as much as we possibly can. But God, for those who are single, I pray that you would bring into their lives significant friendships and relationships and people that they can pour into their lives to see God's best brought out of them. And Lord, as we seek to do that ourselves, I pray that you would surround people, surround us with people who would seek to do that for us as well. But Lord, we do all of this not in our own strength because we will come to the end of ourselves. We do this knowing that the only way we can love and have relationships this way is when we're filled with the love of Jesus. So Jesus, we thank you for your love that went to the cross for us. We thank you for your love that was sacrificial. God, fill us with that love. Change our hearts and our lives with that love and help us to love others with that same kind of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord Jesus, we come before you today. We thank you for your love that didn't play it safe with us, but you gave of yourself completely, sacrificially, so that we could see God's best in our lives. I pray that you would bring people into our lives. If we're married, our spouse, if we're single, other friendships or family members and other significant connections in our lives. I pray that you would bring people in our lives who would love us that way. And I pray that you would help us to be the kind of people that love others that way as well. God, we know we can only do that in your strength and in your empowerment. So God, I pray that your spirit would fill us with the love of Jesus so that we can share it with everyone that we have the opportunity to, to see God's best brought out of them as we would encourage them in every way that we can. God, as we go from this place, God, open our eyes to those relationships. Help us to be intentional about investing into them. And God, may you be glorified in all of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in the grace of God. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday.